Um, as a preface, I should just say that a lot of um, work has gone into the ideas that Tom has is about to present. Um, he's obviously given it the most thought. Um, I've gone over it a lot. We've talked to stakeholders and other witnesses who have testified about these specific issues. Almost everything in here is stuff that we've gone over in one degree or another, obviously not in this precise format. And the goal here is to, to keep on whittling down these ideas to we have um, the group of proposals that we want to um, officially endorse. Um, and this is an iterative process or that's been thought of as an iterative process. Um, and as we get towards the end of the year, the proposals are you know, taking um, more and more shape. That does not obviously prevent us from not um, accepting these proposals at all. We could say not this one, not this time, um, adding or subtracting pieces um, to the proposals. But this is just intended at least to reflect a thought process over the course of the year. As we're waiting for um, Assembly Cup member Kamlag or Dove, Tom, is there any other preface that you'd like to? No, I don't, I don't think so. I uh, would just echo everything you said. These are still in flux and very eager to hear uh, any reactions folks might have or questions and all, all that stuff. You know, we could spend the rest of the day talking about just one of these. So, um, you know, we won't do that. But uh, there's been a lot of work underneath the surface for a lot of them. So if you have questions or concerns, uh, let us know. And we, may, we may have already thought about it or we can uh, figure out a way to address it. And again, and Rick is here too. Rick will help us out a little bit, uh, but we'll save him for the big finale. <laughs> Hi, Rick. And again, the idea is that at our next hearing, which is December 10th, I believe, we won't have any witnesses, any hearing. It will be just to go over these ideas, hopefully refined a little bit more detail, plus the ideas from today. And then at the end, of the here the meeting on the tenth that we say thumbs up or thumbs down uh, on each one. Give it back to the committee to the staff to actually do the final draft and report for January, and then that as a group will get a thumbs up and thumbs down. Or and 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 of course, um, people have specific edits or specific areas of interest that can be all be done along the way. But for the votes, we all need to be present and that needs to be part of the public hearing process. So that's the way that we've envisioned it. Um, as long as uh, Judge Espinoza is actually here, um, and I'm gonna assume that you are, unless I hear otherwise because you said you were, um, I really would love Assembly Kamlager, Mayor Kamlager Dove to be with us because she's, so critical and we're really getting to an important piece. I know it's been a long day, but perhaps we should get started, Tom, unless you think we should get started. Sure. Well, I have one more, uh, I have something I can share to help us filibuster for a bit longer that okay. is responsive to what we were talking about earlier. So this is data from CDCR about their 1170Ds by data. Now this is a very important thing to understand here. This includes the exceptional conduct and all the other ones they've been doing. They've been doing a lot more for people to be sent back for sort of technical sentencing things. But, you know, this big chart is our, you know, of course our buddies in Los Angeles. Um, so I thought this would just be helpful to share with folks. And this is right from CDCR. I can share it with anybody who wants to see it. I know it's kind of small, um, but, you know, some counties have gotten zero, um, 500 to Los Angeles uh, and some other places. So I just thought that was worth a, uh, sharing and, for a moment and the green is green is uh ones that haven't gotten responses yet so orange is response from court and green is ones they're still waiting on okay thank you do, do i understand that i can't read the numbers but a large percentage of the la cases have been responded to um or is it yes yes okay. but i think it looks like it's probably about 30% that are still waiting. And of course, this includes ones that were filed, you know, two weeks ago. So there is some natural number that wouldn't, you wouldn't expect a response to yet, but um, 
I think there was a, a bit of a pause during COVID for a while. Mike, you probably know more about than that. But then a, a bunch went out recently. Yeah, they just they had a um, they furloughed everybody who was working on the 1170D process, as far as I understand. Um, but they're back. I believe they're back. Yeah, well, it's I, like uh, every, for what, the, for what it's worth. I understand that this is also a priority for Kathy Allison and CDCR to try to find um, and encourage. I mean, the way the process works in CDCR right now is that they've asked wardens and, and deputy wardens or assistant wardens to try to help identify the folks that to funnel up the top. And it's, I think it's something that she um, uh, fully supports. So, all right, with that. Yeah, let's get rolling. Okay. Um, if, if folks have, you know, if you want me to zoom in or anything, if, let me know if this doesn't look okay, in other words, but I'll just, I'll just start. And there's a lot of text on, there's just eight slides total, a lot of text on each one. I'll just sort of walk through and then, you know, uh, expand a little bit more. So the first um, proposal here has to do with traffic court uh, and specifically two offenses that are extremely common traffic offenses right now that can be charged either as misdemeanors or infractions. So just to zoom out a little bit, uh, you know, if you just look at pure number of cases, traffic court um, is the bulk of criminal filings in the state of California. We're talking about more than a quarter million of them are uh, misdemeanors every year, and they have significant consequences. You can be arrested for them. You can, the fines and fees are, can get really big. I can walk us through that um, for a second if folks are interested in seeing how that kind of balloons. Um, and, you know, the two offenses are driving offenses that really have nothing to do with safe driving. They are folks who have their license suspended because they didn't go to court or they didn't pay a fine. And often that former category is people not going to court to explain why they can't pay a fine. So they're uh, very closely related to poverty. You know, it, was, it won't be surprising. Uh, there's studies showing that there's a uh, you know, pretty big disparate racial impact as well here with these offenses. And the second one is driving in a license without a license. And that often is a sort of, um, I don't know, if you think of it as a greater or lesser included of a driving on a suspended license. So some really big numbers here. Uh, and all these numbers come from the bill that was a few years ago to eliminate the ability to suspend a license for not paying a fine. But there are still perhaps hundreds of thousands of people who have a license suspended for that reason, because that relief wasn't retroactive, one of our themes here. So between 2006 and 17, more than 4 million people uh, did these things that could lead to a license suspension, so not going to court or failing to, to pay a, a fine or fee, and about uh, you know 600,000 license were actually suspended for those reasons and don't have more up-to-date data than that, but no reason to think it's, it's gone down you know, uh, significantly there. Uh, so the proposal here is pretty simple. Instead of saying, you know, this, these could be misdemeanors or infractions up to the prosecutor, they're infractions. Uh, so you, you take them out of um, a lot of the things in the criminal process. Someone can't be arrested on it. Um, and, you know, it's, it's uh, not treated as a misdemeanor offense anymore. And again, I, I think uh, it's just important to emphasize that there are entirely separate statutes that let your license get suspended for DUI or reckless driving. And this is not about that at all. It's, um, just about these sort of coercive techniques to get people to, to pay court fines and things like that. And, uh, you know, the LA city attorney has been doing this for a while. I think the prosecutor in Santa Clara, Jeff Rosen, who we heard from a few months ago, is also going to be doing it. So it's sort of a recognized, like, you know, uh, way to reduce numbers, address a little bit of the racial disparity in some of these cases, and just to, you know, have a bit more of a rational system. So the outcome would just be along those lines. You'd have a lot less folks uh, having misdemeanor cases, a lot less of those cases on the misdemeanor traffic docket and fines and fees. Uh, if we address that as part of it, it could go down significantly. And I think the other thing we'd want to do here is you get the same amount of points on your license for one of these offenses as you do for DUI. So it's two points. That's what you get for DUI. So there's just a lot to um, you know, take a look at and make sure it sort of makes sense on the way we want to treat these offenses. So we That's, would, so we would uh, set it up so that it was not equivalent to a DUI, so you wouldn't get the two points. Exactly. Uh, but in terms of outcome, how many of these people are actually jailed? So is the outcome really much more that it's freeing up our court some, and it's creating less? Um, you know, having a misdemeanor versus an infraction is a big deal. So is is the is the other key benefits mostly that you have 
fewer people that then accumulate a record as a result of this and you free up your courts versus that you're actually reducing a jail population? I, I think those benefits are the bigger ones. I, I do know in talking to folks about this, people do go to jail for it and you can be arrested for it and, and booked even if that's, you know, um, not a, you know, that's obviously a huge burden and deal. So it does happen. I'm sure you're right that that is not going to be the, the biggest outcome, but I think it's still going to happen. I mean, there's a specific provision in the penal code that lets people go to weekend jail for this offense. Who knows yeah. how often that's used, but, uh, you know, at, at least it was contemplated as, as being, you know, a real crime at some point. Um, and, you know, the other thing that I've also heard from folks about this is, uh, and I, we need to delve into a little bit more, but the, the fees associated when your car is towed, if you get arrested for one of these offenses can be significant. It's just a whole bundle of, of things that, you know, really make these situations, I think, worse to no real discernible benefit for, for the rest of, of, of people. Um, now, while I'm talking about the, uh, the, the, the fines and fees, I want to just share this brief chart. This is from um, uh, a report uh, from the... Um, what's called the Back on the Road Coalition. Let me pull it up here real quick. So this is just sort of a, uh, you know, this is how the fines and fees can balloon pretty quickly. So you start off here with a $100 uh, fine, your base fine on an infraction, and this provision kicks and this provision kicks them down all the way down to where it's close to 500 bucks. And if you're late, it, you know, gets close to doubling. So that's just an example of um, some of the, uh, uh, snowballing consequences like that can happen with these so let me get back to uh and of course the irony is or the not the irony is the compounding factor is that a lot of these people have a fail have a suspended license because they couldn't pay for it in the first place they couldn't pay for the fine or fee in the first place the other thing i should clarify before we go any further is of course as we've done all year we started with the lowest level punishments and working our way up to life sentences so yes we were dealing with fines and fees, misdemeanors, infractions. And as we progress through this slideshow, it will get to more and more uh, serious sentences or lo longer sentences. That's right. All right, well, I'll move on to the second one, unless anybody has any, any other thoughts. Before we, before we move on, is there any questions, comments, additional thoughts about this? All right. Great. Okay. So number two is about um, short sentences and CDCR, basically uh, playing on two facts that we learned that I uh, believe was our July meeting when we when we heard from Mia Bird and Reichen Grate about a study they had done showing that the recidivism outcomes for people who had gone to jail and probation or just probation were better than folks who had uh, done prison sentences, all else being equal. And it was a fairly rigorous study that they had controlled for a lot of factors for us for the most part. The recidivism outcomes were better and significantly better uh, for um, folks who had done a split sentence uh, versus a prison sentence. So 23% lower felony reconviction rate uh, for those folks. Um, and the other fact that we learned was that 37% of the folks going to CDCR with a determinate sentence, which is most people going to CDCR, their average stay once you do the time remaining on their sentence and their, and their credits ends up being less than a year. Uh, and we heard, I think Jay talked this morning about, or maybe it was yesterday, uh, Sam Lewis was talking about folks sitting in reception centers for months at a time. So if you're only gonna beat CDCR for a few months, uh, whatever the value of the programming is, it's unlike you're gonna be able to engage very deeply with it. So this idea um, is to sort of uh, say to the counties, well, you've had these folks, they're only gonna be incarcerated for a few more months, you should keep them. The public safety outcomes are likely to be better and there may be significant cost savings as well because you don't have folks transferring to CDCR, doing a second intake process and uh, dealing with that a whole separate system. So you, we, you would say, state would say the counties, the folks who are gonna be uh, at CDCR for less than a year. And again, that number is just a starting place. It could be shorter, it, it could be longer, but uh, that was sort of the, the data that we were working from. If you're gonna be there less than a year, you're gonna stay in county jail the state will pay you to do that. Um, and that would be a, a way to reduce the number of people going to prison for a very short amount of time. Wouldn't necessarily reduce the incarceration that they're doing, but it would change where they're doing it. So it would sort of be themes of uh, realignment and the juvenile justice realignment that preceded it. And I think part of this can include giving counties uh, more tools to uh, manage their correctional population. So for example, we'll talk about this a little bit when we get to our credits idea. Right now, uh, the credits that you can get in jail are entirely what's pres 
described in the penal code. So if a sheriff wants to have a, you know, a better credit earning for a certain category of person, they can't really do that under current law. That's something CDCR could do. Uh, there's also restrictions on counties being able to sort of uh, share custody over incarcerated people between different jails. So, you know, one jail is overcrowded, but their neighbor has space. There's, uh, they don't have total flexibility to do that. They wouldn't be able to do it for this population if you have a, a, a state prison sentence. So that would be another recommendation we could make that that law be revised. And Senator Skinner, that would be one of these changes that would be adding two words to the statute that would get the job done along the lines that we spoke about earlier for the, some of the realignment issues. Uh, and there's also county parole systems that, you know, there's the idea is that every county under the penal code is supposed to have a county parole board that's supposed to be able to let people out of jail uh, early on, onto supervision. I haven't been able to find that many places that do it, but perhaps you can incentivize places to, to do that too. Again, just giving counties more tools to manage uh, their populations um, as they might be uh, having people staying slightly, long, slightly longer. So that's the overview of, of that idea. This is one that um, tends to provoke a lot of discussion. <laughs> Let me let me start the discussion and say a couple of things. Um, first of all, as has been alluded to, the state prison population in California is down dramatically as a result of COVID. Almost all of that has to do with the fact that they have stopped the intake of people from jails to prison, right? So that's how we're at such a low number. This would, in in some ways, um, <clears throat> carry on at least part of that. Um, benefit to the state or population reduction to the state because 37% of the people, at least for one year, but it could be 18 months, which would be a higher percentage of people going to CDCR. So it would dramatically slow the intake of people to CDCR and the outtake remains the same. So that's how the population uh, comes down. The second thing I wanted to um, flag for people is that we've talked about this in two different ways. We talked about this as a, you could do this as an incentive based program where counties were incentivized to keep these people who had less than, let's say, a year left of their sentence. Um, with, uh, that's very similar to 678. Or it could just be a mandate, a requirement more along the lines of realignment um, with the financial compensation. I, I think that it's fair that if the state is requiring counties to incarcerate these people, that, that the state should pay some portion of that uh, back down to the, to the counties. So I'm curious what people think about this globally, but in particular, I'm curious about this idea about whether an incentive may work and it depends how, how, how strong the incentive is, a requirement would definitely work, but probably face more um, political pushback, I'm guessing. And it's more, you know, state down, you know, to Sacramento. It'd be, it'd be similar to the, anyway, you understand the issue. I, so think we, I think we advocate for the change and let the detail, I mean, this is the kind of detail that gets negotiated between the county association and the legislature and the governor's office. You know, it's one of those where, because even if we said, okay, this one we think is better, the the other, in other words, we may say, all right, the mandate's better. They might negotiate the incentive instead, or we say the incentive's better, and they say, not nah, not level playing field. We're going to negotiate the mandate. So it might be wiser for us just to recommend the change and let then the detail of it be negotiated. That, that makes sense. And I think that different different areas will have, uh, we, I don't anticipate that, you know, word for word, all of our things are going to be adopted, but we should, I think, endorse those practices, which we, we think are best, fully realizing in the process that, that those will change. So if we don't have a strong feeling about the incentive or mandate, which I don't, um, again, I think it's in the data, um, I'm, I'm fine to leave that unspecified, unless other people have strong feelings about it. I don't have strong feelings about that, but I just want to say that this is going to be a, a very unpopular idea in Los Angeles County, and, and I'm going to explain why. During the COVID crisis, our daily census at the jail dropped by 5,000 people, right? We went from a 17,000 plus 
daily census to at one point under 12,000. As a consequence of that, the Board of Supervisors has directed my department to do a couple of things. The first was to come up with a plan to close Men's Central Jail, which is an old dungeon that a lot of people want, want to close. And so I am co-chairing a committee along with the Sheriff's Department to develop a plan to close Men's Central Jail within a year. In addition to which, when the numbers started to creep back up um, post-crisis, not that we're out of the crisis yet, the Board of Supervisors directed the Office of Diversion and Reentry on its own to create what's called the Jail Population Management Council. We had our first meeting. It's an incredibly popular um, council and idea. And one of the things that we know is that because our population is created, one of the main reasons our population is creeping back up is not just because there have been increased bookings. We have 2,500 or so folks in our jail who should have been transferred to state prison some time ago. Right. And those, so they're bumping our numbers up, which is making the work of the council difficult. And the, it's making it difficult for us to, to create a strategy to close Men's Central Jail. Um, because we have all these state prison folks um, taking up beds. And so it's, it's gonna be unpopular, almost universally unpopular, I think in LA County because the activist community is very focused on closing Men's Central Jail and has been for some time. Um, and the Sheriff's Department is gonna tell us that that goal can't be achieved without first getting all these state prison folks out of their jail. So I, I'm, somewhat conflicted by this. I mean, and so, well, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll take everyone's temperature back in LA um, because I'll have plenty of opportunities to do that. My response well, to I, that would be, go ahead, Mike. Of, first of all, I think priority number one is public safety. This is a better public safety outcome. It's the best, it's by far the best, uh, data study that we've had all year. So I think that that should be, you know, number one driving uh, priority. Um, number two is 25 or 2,700 um, extra jail inmates. That's when CDCR is closed. Doesn't seem like a huge number for LA total. Um, and realignment, which basically did a similar thing on a much larger scale, ended up with fewer people incarcerated. Now I realize it put strains on counties, created forced counties or encouraged counties to create alternatives to incarceration. But at the end of the day, fewer people behind bars as a result of realignment. I do yeah. understand that it puts real constraints, especially when people are really uh, dead set and for good reasons about men's central jail. But um, I think from a state's perspective, 23% lower felonies less money, better connection to families. I think it's, in terms of what the committee is looking for, reducing incarceration and improving public safety at the same time, it seems to be at the heartland of what I'm looking for. I, I, do, I do understand their local politics that are very important. I don't mean to be dismissing that, but that's where I've come from. Okay. And, and I, and I and I'll, um, maybe I'll follow up with you after the meeting too, Judge Espinosa, to, to see who in LA might have good ideas. But some of the other tools that might be part of this recommendation to um, encourage, safely encourage less incarceration in the jail with you know, earlier releases because of credits and parole, maybe that um, might be a good tool for the, uh, for the management council to know about too, that uh, there might be more flexibility um, than just what is required under the uh, the Rutherford case right now, too. Yeah, but, we're we're pretty up to speed on all of the uh, discretion the sheriff has to release inmates, to release people from jail. But yeah, we should talk. We should definitely talk offline. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, some of them are come longer, Senator Skinner. Any any other thoughts before we move on? Well, okay. clearly now that Gascon is DA, you know we, I mean. We should run this by, I mean, Judge Espinosa made some really good points and, you know, it may need to be modified to a degree for LA, but there may be folks 
in LA, whether it's in the DA's office or um, affiliated with the county government that may have some ways to, um, to be more creative with it so that it, they can still meet their objective of closing the old, uh, the old men's facility. Um, yeah. So I, I think it's worth it for us to, to give this to a few key allies in LA County to help additionally think it through. Yeah, I, I didn't mean to create the impression that I'm opposed to this recommendation. I just oh, want no, you to I, understand that, that people's hair is gonna catch on fire in LA around the impact it's gonna have on other plans that are, are ongoing. I, yeah, I, so I completely understood that. And having experienced, for example, the juvenile, in the juvenile justice discussion, that when the governor first put out the um, May revised proposal that would have required a certain treatment of juveniles, and LA was like, wait a minute, we do this completely differently. Why would you force us to do it when we have these good outcomes? So I think, uh, and hopefully there's not a whole lot of other counties for which we might um, you know, have this issue, but I think it is appropriate for us to think about whether there's ways to design it so that it does work for, for especially large counties like LA. So it's worth Thank it. Thank you, sure. So the, I'll just add two things. If we do it in, as an incentive base, then that wouldn't require, that wouldn't force anything on LA. LA could just forego the financial incentive. The other thing that has that was a barrier for uh, counties to have flexibility when realignment came down was that LA County could not use San Bernardino County jail capacity. San Bernardino had capacity. They couldn't rent that capacity from San Bernardino. That's a state law. I would propose that we would eliminate that barrier so that if, if, if a neighboring county had capacity and one didn't, that, that you could um, share the capacity um, that way, that counties could make their own arrangements. And of course, DA Gascon, you know, uh, talked about how he was able to reduce the jail population in San Francisco. So hopefully he'll do the same in LA. And the, the other statistic that might be helpful there is um, about bail reform. I know Prop 25 has, you know, changed that a little bit, but the Supreme Court could do something or if local DAs do it. Um, you know, one thing I learned when, when looking into this was in New Jersey, which did bail reform in 2017, I think their jail population dropped by 40% afterwards to the point where they were thinking about closing jails and, and consolidating them. So that might also be a, a factor here too, the very hard to predict given all the different players. All right. Um, the third idea is uh, eliminating mandatory minimum sentences for all nonviolent crimes. And the way to do this is uh, repealing prohibitions on probation or um, strong presumptions against probation. So we've talked about this topic a, a few times, uh, but I think the, the, the theory here is that probation eligibility has no theory in the code right now. You can technically get probation for second degree murder, but there are some nonviolent drug offenses where it's totally forbidden. So it just is sort of a, a random patchwork system as it is right now. Uh, you know, and if you look at some of the results of that and CDCR, 23% of the people there in prison are there for nonviolent offenses, but 20% of all probation sentences are for violent crimes. So it just uh, doesn't seem like there's necessarily a, uh, a coherent theory behind that. I'm sure there's more to the story than just those numbers tell us. But uh, the idea here would just be to go through the penal code and say these, this pro, you know, this law that says you can't get probation for this nonviolent offense, that's now up to the judge. Or this this part saying in this particular offense, uh, it's strongly disfavored. That's now up to the judge. In particular, this following up on what Miss Irwin said this morning, first degree burglary, which is the burglary of an inhabited dwelling, that right now uh, is essentially probation and eligible as a strong um, presumption against it. And so this would allow a little more flexibility for that offense in particular. It would also cover, you know, these situations where, you know, if you have two prior felony convictions of any kind from any time, you're presumptively not going to get probation no matter what your current offense is. So I think that would be included here too. It would really let the 
expand uh, judges' power and discretion to consider the full circumstances of not just someone's offense, but you know uh, what their background is and any factors that may have led to it. And there's also a few things included here where uh, we'd want to be careful to to make sure we address them, which is for some offenses, even when you get probation, the law, the penal code requires a mandatory condition in jail right now. So you get probation, but there's still a mandatory minimum associated with it. For example, looting has a six month jail condition associated with it. So that would be uh, part of the recommendation here is just to say if it's nonviolent, uh, up to the judge about probation. If there's a prohibition of it or presumption against it, um, that would be no longer in the code and the power would be with the judge again. Any thoughts, any questions? Great, <laughs> all right. Mike, do you have anything you wanna to add to this one or should I keep on grooving? Oh, this is good, keep on going. Okay, excellent. Number four, uh, again, following a little bit about what we spoke about this morning with Ms. Irwin has to do with S robberies. And the proposal here is to create a new offense that would cover that situation, something like aggravated shoplifting. So as we heard about a few months ago, the robbery statute in California, the core definition is from 1872 and by case law, particularly a case from 1983 called People Against Estes, a shoplifting where you get into an argument with uh, security on your way out or you bump shoulders or have a very brief altercation with them, that is treated as a full-blown violent robbery offense. It's a strike, it's violence. Um, it's treated the same as if, you know, a, a much more serious offense of using a, a, a gun to mug someone on the street would be. And, uh, you know, as Judge Espinoza told us, and as, you know, as we've spoken to folks around the state about this, this, this happens a lot with uh, young people, people with mental health issues who just, you know, when that moment comes and security perhaps catch, catches them on the way out, they, they have a, um, a reaction to that. If, if that wasn't considered a robbery, it would in most cases be a shoplifting offense, which is a mandatory misdemeanor, six months county jail is the maximum sentence. So it's quite a jump from a shoplifting offense all the way to a violent robbery. Um, and, I, and you know, we looked at a few other states here, I think it was 15 states total, and basically 14 other states had more variations in their degree of robbery. It didn't just take a definition from 1872, like California has done for the most part, and say, you know, this is what we're going to apply to a wide range of circumstances with very serious consequences, even if the conduct uh, in all these different cases is, is not as serious as it is from one to another. So California is a, an outlier here and sort of not, you know, addressing what are very common uh, offenses by not having the penal code address it with a little more specificity and a little more tuned to the seriousness of each one. So the proposal is that there'd be a new aggravated shoplifting offense. It would be uh, a nonviolent offense a wobbler, which means it could be charged as a felony or a misdemeanor up to the prosecutor. And if charged as a felony, a judge would have the power to reduce it if it was, uh, if the facts of the case made that appropriate. Um, if there's a weapon involved or serious injury, this would not apply to that. That would probably still be considered a robbery. So you wouldn't sort of, uh, you, you'd really be targeting those cases that um, are less serious where the uh, penalty should reflect that as well. We tried to figure out, you know, how many Estes robberies are there every year. It's it's not really captured because it's just considered a robbery. It's lumped in of all the other ones. But you can you can do some sort of rough back of the envelope calculations, and it looks like there are about seven thousand unarmed robberies of commercial establishments establishments every year. So that's the universe that we're we're talking about here. So this would let the penal code be a little more rational and reflect the seriousness of these offenses. Would modernize it in the way that a number of other states have done. Can we include in this, I think this is a good idea, but can we, you know, when we were talking about Estes, we didn't talk about this thing we learned today around the mm -hmm. detached and the attached garages. That's, so, well, those so are me, burglaries. Okay, so, different, yeah. Different so, crime. Similar outcomes in terms of the. I was thinking about. Uh, I, was, I thought you were going somewhere else. First of all, a detached garage is not a, uh, a first degree burglary. Detached. That's what I okay. meant. Yeah, that's the what I meant. The current, the current law, though, is, is, is where we want it. It has to be an attached garage that creates a burglary, uh, burglary. But where I thought you were going, Senator Skinner, was 
What uh, also Ms. Irwin was saying was the, the cell phone snatch or the purse snatch, right? Those are also considered robberies. And may we say instead of aggravated shoplifting, it should be aggravated theft. Okay. And say- yeah. so we're getting those two words where it was a non- Right, when there's no weapon and no serious injury, right. then it's aggravated theft, whether it's shoplifting, purse snatching, cell phone snatching, whatever. Right. Not full blown robbery. Right. Right. Okay. But, and yes, we should consider that. But can we also additionally consider that a stealing a bike is stealing a bike, whether you're going into the detached or the attached garage? Yeah. How would we do that? It's well, different. I will say the, the, we, the we probation. The garages. I mean, <laughs> go ahead. It's yeah, it gets it gets and, and those burglary cases, they're even more extreme examples. I mean, I, 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 I there's a case where taking something from a tent was considered going the same as going into somebody's house or a, an apartment that hadn't been lived in for two and a half years. So the law um, does have some you know extreme examples in it as it, as it often does. Uh, the the probation idea we just discussed, the burglary of in those situations um, would be affected by that. It would it would be more probation eligible than it is now, but it wouldn't be a fundamental change to the elements of the offense like we're talking about uh, with, the, with the robbery statutes. Um, and I would, we accept, that was something we can, we can, we can yeah, look at. Maybe into, we just need a separate look at the burglary statute. Mm -hmm. Sure. I would agree with that. Yeah. Anything else on Estes, aggravated shoplifting, aggravated theft from anybody? Great, all right. No, except concur with Mike regarding the, uh, uh, the not, call, not referring to shoplifting and broadening it a bit. Yeah. We'll, we'll, take, we'll, we'll take a look at it. The, the, one of the, the ease of the Estes things is that it's very defined in, in, in case law. So there's sort of a, a path to follow, but we can, we can definitely look at sort of the uh, theft from a person. And then then it well. might end up being two things, an aggregate, aggravated shoplifting and an aggravated theft versus. Right. Okay, excellent. So these next few ideas are about uh, some of the sentencing enhancements, some of the, the thing that there's a lot of comments about yesterday and that, you know, uh, I think every panelist that we spoke with mentioned it to some degree in the last two days. Uh, so right now, judges have a power under something called Penal Code Section 1385 to ignore, to dismiss almost all sentencing enhancements when coming up with a, with a sentence. Um, the only guidance in the Penal Code for that is that it has to be in the furtherance of justice. The California Supreme Court has weighed in a few times and hasn't done much to, to clarify, except to say that this can be used against any enhancement uh, that isn't specifically excluded from it by, by the legislature. So that means it covers things like three strikes, gang enhancements, nickel priors, things that were created by initiative can still be struck under 1385. And you know, as, we, as we've heard and as we know, sentencing enhancements are a huge driver of uh, incarceration. 80% of people in CDCR had one and 25% had three or more. And we heard, you know, Jay's story this morning of the number of enhancements in, in his case. And in particular, uh, you know, this would be a way at addressing some of the racial disparity and some of the um, discrimination against uh, people with mental health issues uh, by allowing judges to think about those things uh, when considering these enhancements. So the idea is 1385 could be amended to include our favorite tool, which is a presumption uh, in certain cases that enhancement should be struck if certain facts are present. For example, if you're relying on an enhancement uh, that's based on a prior conviction, that conviction is more than five years old or some amount of time, presumptively you should strike that and not increase the sentence as a result of it. Or if the conviction was from when the person was a juvenile, or uh, if some of the current enhancements have a, a connection to a serious mental health issue, or if uh, there's evidence of a you know, disparate racial impact in the, in the use of the enhancement. So it would create uh, a presumption that the, you know, some direction from the legislature about what the court should do in these circumstances. And it would also open up um, 
a venue for defense counsel and you know people being prosecuted that it's appropriate to talk about these things which uh you know the kind of discussions that i think the committee has been having are not the kind that happen in courtrooms when cases are, are talked about so we create a space to uh to talk about some of these things in a more formal way and it would just provide uh guidance and encouragement to to judges to use the power that they already have uh and it would you know in the appropriate cases result in much shorter sentences and you know all the positive benefits that we've, we've spoken about the last few days about that. Any questions, concerns, thoughts? So this does not require two thirds vote? That's right. It's uh, multiple examples of uh, judges being able to strike enhancements for things that otherwise were passed by own initiative. Three strikes, uh, nickel prior, all that. Okay. okay. That would be tweaking an existing law, essentially. Tweak might not be the right word, but modifying existing law. Okay. Okay. I have two points before yeah. moving on. First is uh, I just got a text from consultant that says that uh, the burglary statute actually was expanded by court rule and not by statute. So that might be a very sensible and easy fix. Great. Um, just we should flag that. Um, and then with the 1385 work, and this is something that Judge Espinoza and you know, I hope that Justice Moreno and others can help us with is that um, a lot of our proposals are trying to give more authority to judges, um, but sometimes we get pushback from judges that don't want the responsibility. This adds, with, with more authority comes more responsibility um, and more time. So you could imagine that a sentencing hearing now becomes more time consuming uh, if you have to consider whether it was connected to a mental illness. I, I would hope that judges would want to be given more guidance and help and power, but can you, exp I, I, and I also completely appreciate that the courts are swamped. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts or reflection on that. It just seems, um, go ahead. Sorry. Um, it's been my experience that a frequent course amongst judges during educational programs and other gatherings is that the desire to have more discretion. I don't think it, I don't think you would, this is just my, this is just me speaking, but I don't think there'd be a lot of pushback from the bench on giving them additional authority and guidance on how to exercise that authority. That's encouraging. And, and to, to, to D. Alec Gascon's point, the last two governors have been appointing a lot of public defenders to the bench. Um, so so there, there is a sort of, there is a sort of sea change in the way the work is being done by younger judges, I think. Great. All right, well, I'll move on unless anybody else is in the other comments. So the next one is uh, gang enhancements. And uh, Rick will help us out with this one. He's really been leading the, 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 the charge on this. Uh, so I'll just give the quick overview. Um, you know, gang enhancements, 92% of the people, 92% of the people who have them are black or Latinx. So that's just, uh, I know we say it a lot. I think we can't say it enough, basically. And we're talking around 10,000 people in, in, in prison. And we have pretty good data on this because if you have a gang enhancement, it makes your offense a serious one. So you're going to go to CDCR, even no matter um, what the underlying felony was. So these folks are are in prison. Uh, you know, we heard from at our last meeting in September about some of the issues with the statutory language um, that, it, you know, to me, it's a bit of a paradox. When you look at the statute, it seems very complicated that it has a lot of moving parts and that it would be difficult to make out a criminal street gang, but it seems to be uh, an opposite effect that, um, you know, the, 
it's it's easier to apply to apply to a, a group of folks than perhaps you would expect just looking at the law. And as we know, it can also be applied to misdemeanor offenses, which in many uh, instances result in them being a, a felony. And it's just uh, a law that from its inception has uh, been thought of as, as very flawed. One of my favorite quotes is when it was being passed in 1988, Bill Lockyer, who was uh, in the legislature at that point, said this law is gonna be laughed out of court. Um, and that is of course not the result of what happened. And in fact, what happened in the year 2000 that it was amended by Proposition 21, which creates um, you know, some difficulties and the approaches the committee can take to it. At heart, this is probably a law that should be totally repealed. It may not be redeemable in any way, but uh, that would take two thirds of a vote or in the legislature or an initiative. So what uh, Rick has been looking at is ways to target the law at what all the legislative material about the law says it was supposed to be targeted at, which is you know violent organized groups um, that uh, you know are not you know a, a collection of folks who know each other from the from the same neighborhood. Um, and there's sort of two ways to do that. The first way is to, to add more to the statutory definition of what a, a, a criminal street gang is, to specify that it needs to be a violent enterprise uh, and some other adjustments we could make there. And the second way to get at this is to increase um, the protections or uh, to require prosecutors to use reliable evidence when grooming these things in court. And there's two main ideas here. First is anything that's about the gang enhancement is presented to the jury in a separate proceeding. So this is called bifurcation. There was a bill on this a, a few years ago. Um, basically you take the gang enhancement evidence out of the main trial and you say, we're only gonna consider this gang evidence if the person is found guilty. And the reason for that is that there have been studies showing that just saying the word gang in the courtroom and having that evidence, it makes juries more likely to convict. Um, in cases where they may not have otherwise. So it just has a hugely prejudicial impact. Um, and the other way to, to, to get at that prejudicial impact is to require prosecutors to use direct or circumstantial evidence to prove the elements of the gang offense. So the way, as we heard um, you know, in September, that a lot of these cases unfold is that a, a gang expert is called by the prosecution, often a police officer who can essentially direct the jury that all the elements to prove the gang enhancement have, have been met. And it's, um, and Rick can speak a little bit more about this, but it's it's an unusual way of, of presenting a case to have one officer testify to uh, all these very different facts that uh, should, can and should be proven uh, more directly as every other, every element of an offense needs to be proven. And there's some precedent for this in the penal code. For example, there's special evidentiary rules around you know, uh, accomplice testimony um, and in custody informants. So there's, uh, you know, the penal code already does acknowledge when there's special prejudice from some types of evidence that makes sense to take special care about it. So these are things that would not eliminate the gang enhancement, but I think would target it in a way uh, that should reduce its use and would be hopefully limited to those cases where uh, it was it was most appropriate. Um, but Rick, I don't know if you have anything you wanna add to that or we can see if, uh, any folks have any questions or comments? Uh, the only thing I'll add is that I think that in talking to practitioners, what um, they continue to mention is that if you are gonna change some of the definitional language uh, regarding what is a criminal street gang, it does have to be accompanied by the bifurcation and the evidentiary requirements. And if that doesn't happen, it could result in even more prejudicial trials and evidence coming in. So I think you have to look at it as a whole. Um, I remember we had some conversation about the use of um, gang enhancements to elevate misdemeanors to felonies and making those felonies a strike as a consequence. I was hoping, I don't see it in here, maybe I'm just not reading it carefully. I'm, I'm hoping we can develop some language to put an end to that practice? Judge, that practice was allowed um, by voter initiative. Okay. And so that is one of the things that would require a two thirds vote. However, I think in the previous slide mention of using 1385 as an avenue to get at that, uh, the committee could consider creating a presumption that the gang enhancement be stricken if the underlying conduct is misdemeanor conduct. Okay, that'd be great. Or nonviolent conduct in general. Correct.
All right. Well, that's our uh, approach to gang enhancements at the moment. If nobody else has any other questions, we'll uh, move on. Another enhancement idea has to do with applying repealed sentencing enhancements to everyone. I think, Mike, you spoke a little bit about this this, this morning, um, this idea that you know someone who was sentenced on one day gets the benefit of a change in the law, someone sentenced the next day doesn't is just you know inherently unfair. Uh, and that sentence enhancements that have been repealed in recent memory should be repealed from the sentence of everyone who was uh, still incarcerated as a result. So in particular, we're talking about two enhancements. One uh, extremely common one, the one year, uh, one year enhancement for a prior prison or jail term. Uh, this was eliminated in a, in a law last year and in the legislative activity around that, CDCR estimated there were about 10,000 people just in prison who had this enhancement. Big caveat there. This is um, unlike some of those enhancements you were speaking about earlier, Senator Skinner. This is one that doesn't require you to go to prison. So there may be people in jail, and likely are a significant number of people in jail who also uh, had this or, or have this. So the numbers are, are quite big. Uh, and there's also another enhancement repealed a few years before that. This was the three year enhancements for uh, prior drug convictions in certain cases probably a lot less used on the one year enhancement. Uh, but one thing that the sheriffs have uh, said is that the folks doing long sentences in jail, a lot of the driver of that is drug cases. And this may be a result um, of this enhancement as well. Data is much sketchier here to close to being non-existent, I should say. Um, and because these enhancements were essentially totally repealed with a few small exceptions, this isn't a situation where you'd need to go to court and have a judge, you know, look at the case, say, well, you know, I don't know if I would have, uh, if, if this sentence makes sense anymore. These enhancements are just gone. So I think the proposal here would um, include an administrative solution to where CDCR, the jail, could remove the enhancements and do a new uh, commitment order without requiring the additional expense of, of people going to court, as you, as you, as you might otherwise expect. So um, this would, you know, result in a lot less incarceration in the short term. And of course, long term, the enhancements are gone now. So this would sort of just be, um, you know, applying uh, equally what the legislature has already decided to do. You know, and, and there's one other thing I would I would add here. It, it, it is connected to our discussion of 1170 D1. So CDCR, in, additional, in addition to their extraordinary conduct referrals under 1170 D1, they do also refer people for resentencing if, uh, there, if there's been a change in the law or an enhancement has been repealed that wasn't applied retroactively. CDCR does have a process of identifying those people and sending them back to court. Um, there is some qualification you have to do to do that and they're not doing it en masse. So you're seeing a few hundred people go, um, but this is also sort of happening through that uh, process as well. But what this proposal would be, would be sort of a, you know, not any discretion on CDCR's part, they would just, you know, be directed to uh, remove the additional incarceration from the appropriate sentences. So it's just allowing them, in effect, it's doing a retroactivity that allows authorities to do it administratively. Exactly. Okay. So we might want to Administratively, okay. Um, yeah. Okay. And there, yeah, so it's a lot of the expense, you know, with going back to court. I mean, a lot of it, all of it <laughs> would be saved. Well, not only the expense, but right now, because uh, well, the courts are underfunded, period. And then with COVID, they're constrained. So the less, uh, you know, with being smart about the less. Uh, impositions we put on them right now, since it's they're in difficult straits, the better. I would also say that whatever increased population that are, I mean, it may not be fair to tie two different proposals together, but getting to what Judge Espinoza was saying, that any increased by uh, having these people serve who are the short sentences, eliminating the short sentences in CDCR would probably be offset by eliminating the one year sentence enhancement in this particular proposal because of the number of people in jails. We don't have the, the real numbers on that. That's just a guess, but um, I think it would be upset at least partially, certainly upset partially. We just don't know how much. But. Okay. All right, and the grand finale, 
my favorite topic, credits. <laughs> um, so we've talked about this idea a few times. I know it's getting late, uh, so I won't belabor it, but basically you're in jail, you're in prison. If you were cloned and put one person in the other, you're getting different credits a lot of the times, and there doesn't seem to be any real reason for it. It just, I think, is a result of laws not being in sync with each other. So um, great topic for the committee, I think, given our statutory mandate, and would have a huge impact. You know, everyone who's incarcerated for the most part is eligible for credit. So even a small tweak here, you know, it's like changing the, the course of a, of a ship over time, it could have a, a huge um, impact. Uh, you know, we've been over these specific examples. I feel like it's, it's too late in the day to start talking about percentages. So I'll just talk about one that I think we haven't focused on too much. And that has to do with people who are found incompetent to stand trial. Judge Espinoza, as usual, please feel free to cut me off when I start getting this wrong. But right now, if you're sent to the state hospital, you get no good conduct credit. So um, if you were confined in jail, you would be doing less time than if you are sent to the state hospital. So in effect, uh, people with you know serious mental health issues are going to end up being doing more incarceration than folks who don't have it. And uh, again, I think this is a, a change in law that would take two or three words to affect and um, seems long overdue. That's accurate. Great. Well, not great, but thank you. Um, you know, we, we could talk about some of these specific ones if, if, if you want to, but essentially, um, you know, jails don't look so much at your prior conviction history. CDCR takes it more into account and jails are limited to, uh, you know, the amount that's in the penal code right now and can't be more generous if, if they want to. Uh, so these are things that, you know, should be equalized between the two settings. And then uh, um, as, as we heard about from Ms. Vargas Edwin this morning, you know, in um, prisons, you can get milestones, et cetera. You can get up to 12 weeks yeah. off in jail. It's, it's, it's six weeks. So just would want to let folks have as many opportunities as, as is appropriate for them. And speaking of her testimony this morning, uh, we, we, we could consider adding a wrinkle that would allow uh, credits to be used against youth offender parole dates, which they're currently not allowed, as I understand it, in state prison. Sure. That's part of the larger conversation that we were talking about getting people to the parole board earlier, but would it specifically apply to youth offenders? Yeah, and maybe other categories too. I don't know if there's similar exclusions for other folks, but yeah. As long as we're on this topic, another big credit question that um, I don't want to add about a, a, a risk of opening a can of worms uh, at this late time. CDCR Prop 57 was what created a lot of new um, ability to CDCR to grant credits. And part of the problem that we have here is that the new credits under Prop that were given to the power that was given to CDCR to create new credit systems under Prop 57 eclipsed the statutory credits that are done for the jail system. One thing that, the, that CDCR has not done that I know a lot of people are very, um, feel is unfair about the new credit system in CDCR is that, that those credits are not applied retroactively. So in other words, if you were serving a crime that got 25% credit and you'd done 10 years and then along comes Prop 57 and they change that to 50% credit. You get 50% credit from the day after Prop 57 regulations went into effect. You don't get the 50% credit going all the way back to day one. Whereas if you were convicted today of the very same crime in the very same instance, you would get the Prop 57 credit for your whole time. So I would consider throwing into the mix retroactivity of the Prop 57 credits. There are some that are harder to apply. Um, was a certified program from 1982 justifiable as a, as a milestone credit? But let's just avoid those complicating problems for the time being. The big ones are the good time credits anyway. Um, and that could be done by computer overnight, could just apply credits that are currently being given retroactively. Is that right, Tom? I've, I've, I mean, I think in, in theory, yes, it should be that easy, but I think in, in practice, it, um, 
Okay. gets more complicated. Some of those administrative reasons are, are, are perhaps reasons why it hasn't been done, but that's something we can explore with, with uh, the right folks at CDCR, I think. How do people feel about that? Or is that a, bag, a, a can of worms that we should leave to another day? It may be a can of worms worth opening. I mean, I think it's, you know, it seems fair at, at its most basic level. It goes along with the same idea. If, it's, if, the, if the statute's been repealed or the enhancement's been repealed for people from going forward today, why aren't the people who got the same exact crime, same exact situation getting the benefit from before? It also makes the credit calculation insanely complicated and very difficult. I mean, literally you need a computer to calculate anybody's credits and this would just- You mean under the current circumstance for- Correct. Okay. Correct. I mean, it would still be, I'm not saying that we would solve this and make all credits simple by doing that, by requiring the Prop 57 credits be retroactive, but it would simplify things all for a lot of folks. So we, there, we had the ability, I think, to do that administratively when yes. the, and I think what happened or what we were told is that CDCR, they, the reason that uh, Brown did not pursue that is because CDCR told them they didn't have records. Okay. And, but the irony was that meanwhile, when you went to, so you couldn't get the retroactive credit and we were told you didn't have records, but then when you were the incarcerated individual who then tried to take that program again, you were told, no, you can't take that program because you have already taken it. So there's clearly some, anyway, but I think it's, we can do it. It, it can be done both administratively. So it doesn't even need a statute change. It's purely the regs for, or it can be statute. But so I think, one because it's regs it's a good one to bring to the governor's attention here's the plus, go ahead i was going to say plus the discussion we had earlier today about being able to keep um credits yeah Here, here's here's the thing that i think that cdcr was mucking up the conversation um to oversimplify a little bit as i understand it there are two large groups of credits there's what's called good time credits which is just X percent, if you have a nonviolent crime, you get off of your sentence. That is the vast majority of right. time off people's sentences. That part seems to be, can be done by a computer overnight. What kind of sentence do you have? What kind of conviction do you have? And when did you start serving? And just blah, 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 blah. What gets complicated, and I do have some sympathy for CDCR, and this gets to the records issue, is when there's a program that you took in 1982, we don't know how good that program was. Would it qualify by today's standards for the second type of credits called milestone credits, which are given to people for accomplishing certain- Well, I, I wouldn't use that as the, I just, I wouldn't even bring that up. The reason is we don't have a standard for the uh, quality of the programs now. So I wouldn't even use that. I would say it's much more a matter of, do we have proper records that if we were to allow you to have some retroactivity for participation in programs, can we actually, um, you know, is that, a, is it going to be fair because do we have the records or not? Because the question about what is the quote unquote standard of a program or quality of the program, I mean, that that's a whole ball, of, a whole Pandora's box. Correct. I would eliminate that conversation altogether and take the programming and milestone credits off the table and say, we're okay, we're not going to apply those retroactively. They're relatively, I mean, they can be, they're not nothing, but compared to the good time credits, they're small. And let's do the good time credits, which I think can be done mathematically relatively simply. Those should be done. Let's just do the easy part. That's my feeling. If, if, if the milestone credits can also be done easily, and I agree with you, I know exactly what you're saying about like, oh no, you can't take that program now. That seems, the, but it seems just that the good time credits, that should be, unless I'm mistaken, and I'm sure I'll get word from folks that I am, much, much easier than applying the milestone credits. And I'm not meaning to diminish that milestone, milestone credits are important and they're good and we should encourage them, but at least the good time credits, which apply automatically, right. 
that seems like a simpler fix that avoids so a lot of why don't, why don't we recommend both? And that way, then, uh, you know, the people who have the responsibility have to come back and, and describe what are these difficulties to do those things. I, I agree. What I just don't want is I think that people can, I think that people conflated those issues and didn't realize that, oh, well, you could separate out a big bunch that would be easy. Right. So I think that if we are aware that there's ways to separate out easy ones. Yeah, from so we separate out the, the recommendations, but we make them both. Correct. I, 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 that sounds right to me. All right, great. Well, that, that's it for old business and we snuck some new business in there too, so good. <laughs> <laughs> um, do, before, we have a couple of more things to do that are mostly administrative updates. Before we get to that, does anybody have any comments, thoughts, suggestions on anything that we substantively that we've talked about today? Okay. Thank you all. Been another long day, but I think really productive. Thank you, Tom and the staff for these slides. The lack of, I'm taking the lack of feedback on each of one of these slides as a little bit of an as endorsement of our process in that we've kind of whittled these down and we've talked about them enough over time that they're not unfamiliar and we're all kind of in agreement that these are kind of the details that um, we like. Um, I don't want to speak for everybody, but um, that seems to be working. It may also just be the time of day, but as you digest these, let's please, you know, get back to Tom and me, because as I said, at our next meeting, we are really hoping to give a thumbs up or thumbs down to these proposals. All right. Um, so I have a couple of administrative matters and updates that I want to, um, bring to everybody's attention. First of all, I think I mentioned this already, but I just want to make sure that everybody's aware and to thank Arnold Ventures, which is has given um, the University of California is the California Policy Lab, which is a consortium of, of researchers at UCLA and UC Berkeley, um, almost a million dollars over two and a half years uh, to work with us and to help provide further data support as the data starts coming in from CDCR and hopefully the DOJ soon. Um, and as we said, from, from LA. Um, this is including Mia Bird and her team and uh, Steve Raphael, who was an another empiricist who testified by the before the committee early on. I think there'll be a tremendous benefit and many thanks to Arnold Ventures. They're very excited about what we're doing. They put me and Tom in touch with other committees that they're, there's a, New Jersey Sentencing Committee that's doing similar work. So they've been extraordinarily helpful. And of course, the money is very much appreciated. Uh, data. Um, CDCR has finally, we're at the final stages of almost, almost, almost getting the data from CDCR. A lot of this has been, the last bits have been on the security protocols, which of course we, you know, want to be a million percent in compliance with and literally down to getting the, the computer science people who are be handling this re-fingerprinted re for the second or third time to make sure that their fingerprints are done precisely the way that CDCR wants to do it. So that's happening and should happen like hopefully next week even. Is it possible, Tom? I We, we should not, let's, the, okay. well, let's say, not jinx anything. It's not even... <laughs> Okay, I also wanna say that we are in continuing conversations with the Department of Justice and Attorney General's office to collect a lot of data from them. It's critical to have the, the data from CDCR is helpful, but it doesn't make, there's a, we can't make a lot of sense of it in terms of the estimated impact of reforms without having the data from DOJ and vice versa. So a good example is the gang enhancements is that we know that 92% of the people who get gang enhancements are Black and Latinx. We don't know who was charged with a gang enhancement at the beginning of the day. So that the first bunch of information is in CDCR's hands. The second, who was charged with it and who is eligible is in, is in DOJ's hands. So 
big part of it is to, to marry this data together, marrying this data together and putting it in, into one consolidated uh, criminal justice database for the state would be, no other state does, does it like that. I mean, this is real, would be a really extraordinary accomplishment for uh, the committee. And it's something that we, the staff, Tom and others have been working very, very hard on. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to it and helpful, hopeful about it. Schedule stuff. Uh, our next meeting is uh, December 10th, as I've mentioned a few times. I really hope everybody can make it because this is gonna be a vote up or down on the recommendations. Then early January, we'll have our final meeting of the year, as it were, uh, to vote on the report that will be drafted uh, basically between now and then. Um, and we'll also discuss at our January meeting agenda for 2021 and beyond. Um, Brian will be in touch with the actual scheduling. And I need to say that as Tom and Rick and Natasha and Laura and, and me, as, as we are starting to really put pen to paper, if you all have thoughts or concerns or suggestions, like now is the time to, to say it. And we, we, can, we, can, we have to make this, the, the big decisions thumbs up and down by committee at public hearings, but please communicate with Tom if there are certain details of the credit scheme or the gang enhancements or whatever um, that you think are particularly important. That, that's you know, happening now. And I, you know, I take good note of what uh, Senator Skinner was saying is in some ways, we, some places will probably be probably quite prescriptive as what our recommendation might be and other areas might not be and appreciating that there will be a legislative process beyond our work and that we're just trying to help the legislature as much as possible. All right, that's all I have. Brian, have I missed anything? Question. Yes. So our recommendation when we vote in December, so we just saw a deck, but we also um, today or in the last two days, we had some recommendations regarding parole, some other things. So it, our, um, our vote in December will be on additional to what we just went through. Correct. So we when through. will we potentially see that in advance in order to give feedback before we're put in the position of the vote? That's a very good question. I, it's going to be hard to do it by, we will, we can distribute it by, correct me if I'm wrong, Tom or Brian, distribute it in advance in writing. That will have to be, that will be public as a memorandum before December. Okay. We'll get that to you as soon as possible. But we cannot discuss it right. as a group before December. Right. So we have, what we will have in December is probably 10 ideas. The eight we discussed today with some of the wrinkles and changes that we had, but they will be pretty familiar to everybody. Plus parole and then number two, 1170D. Okay. Yep. That's, the, that's the plan. Now, if there are other ideas, again, don't hesitate to reach out to Tom or Rick. Uh, we just can't discuss it as a group. We, you, you can just, we could, again, my understanding is that Two of us can discuss it, but we can't discuss it as a group. So if you need to bounce an idea off of me or one of others, you know, I, I'm always here. Um, any other questions procedural or otherwise that anybody has? We need to vote on the minutes. Uh, so there was minutes distributed by email. And um, I guess I move to move the move to vote the minutes into the record. <laughs> Does anybody second that? Thank you, Assemblymember Comlogger. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Anybody opposed? Okay. Uh, those minutes are now adopted. Thank you. Thank you for preparing the minutes. Um, thank you all. These have been a long couple of days. They're extremely rewarding to me. I like seeing you all. Um, 
it's been convenient to do this in some ways by Zoom and we can get our witnesses here, but other times I really wish I could sit around a table and hammer these things out with you. So I hope in the future, maybe we'll have some combination of the two um, because I, you know, that was also something, something I missed. I taught my first class in person on Wednesday and it was really, really, really great to see my students yeah. even who were all masked up and outside. I can't emphasize enough, these are crazy times. So thank you all for your hard work and especially to the staff who are really killing it. So thank you guys. Um, have a good weekend and uh, we are now adjourned. That's my hammer, bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye.